All right, welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Um, thank you for joining us all today. Uh, I'm Joe Benitez. I am an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. Uh, TOPS is organized by Justin White, uh, the University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pesco at Georgia State University, Catherine McLean at George Mason University, and Si Shang at the Ohio State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator as well as the discussant. And the audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. So please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Uh, please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. And comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. And your comments are very much appreciated today. Uh, this presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. And I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from George Mason University to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our fall 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Lisa Cox entitled, Effect of Renaclene Added to Counseling on Smoking Cessation Among African-American Daily Smokers. Lisa Sanderson Cox, PhD, Professor of Population Health at the University of Kansas School of Medicine and member of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program of the University of Kansas Cancer Center is dedicated to advancing health equity and advancing tobacco use treatment for underserved smokers. Her collaborative interdisciplinary work focuses on improving pharmacotherapy and behavioral interventions for African-Americans, Latinos, and light smokers. Dr. Cox leads the Kick It at Swoop, KISS, pharmacotherapy clinical trials with African-American smokers supported by the National Cancer Institute and National Institute on Drug Abuse. Her efforts within the Junto's Center for Advancing Latino Health include an NCI-sponsored trial of text messaging for Latino smokers, her participation with the NCI Moonshot Cancer Center Cessation Initiative reflects her longtime interest in promoting tobacco treatment for cancer patients. Lisa enjoys being involved in education nationally and internationally, including work with the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco and SNRT University. Our discussant today is Justin White, a tobacco researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. Nikki Nolan, a professor at the University of Kansas School of Medicine, is a co-author of the study and will answer select Q&As. Dr. Cox, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to be with this really broad audience, and I look forward to the discussion at the end of the talk today. Um, and as mentioned, my colleague and co-author Nikki Nolan is with us as well. So I'm looking forward to um, sharing the discussion with her. I want to begin by, uh, let's see. Can you see my slides right now? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry, I just seem to be having a challenge. There we go, recording this. Um, I want to mention, I don't have any conflicts of interest. The study that I'm gonna be talking about today is a Varenicline clinical trial and the medication for the study, the active and placebo medication was provided um, by Pfizer Global Medical Grants and Pfizer provided the medication but was not involved in the design or analysis or interpretation of findings. Uh, I have a lot of acknowledgements, but I want to share that this work has been going on for almost 25 years, originally started by Jazz Alawalia, and it's a great example of team science that has been supported by the community and the collaborations there are what really makes this possible. So I have a number of um, collaborators, both within the University of Kansas and then also um, Within, with different institutions. It's multidisciplinary group of individuals. And the people who are highlighted here are the folks that were involved in this particular um, clinical trial uh, and that really made this work possible. So I couldn't be more thankful to work with such a great group of people. I also, as I mentioned, said that 
community involvement is really key for this kind of work. We're one of the only groups that focus on advancing treatment for African Americans and collaboration with partners in the community are really key. So in Kansas City, um, our work is has a home in a federally qualified health center called Swope Health. And uh, Swope is really in the heart of the community and makes this possible, it gives us a great, um, a great environment and a, and a great place to conduct this work. But it's nice that we also have a lot of support throughout the community. Uh, I, I will also mention that Dr. Emanuel Cleaver, Reverend Cleaver used to be the uh, mayor of Kansas City. He's one of our Congress people and um, he's been supportive for 20 years. So we are very grateful. Now, the work that we've done spans a number of different studies, primarily focused on pharmacotherapy treatments for African-American smokers, really trying to enhance treatment, enhance outcomes with the goal of reducing tobacco-related morbidity and mortality, and really um, making some progress in terms of reducing tobacco-related health disparities. The specific study that I'm going to talk about today is this highlighted work. One, and it was uh, it was sponsored by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So this is the paper that came out in JAMA, JAMA this summer that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but as I get into that, I'm just going to sort of set the stage. And I'd like to ask this audience to approach hearing about this with the question in mind of how can advances in tobacco treatment, how can advances in policy really advance health equity. So my work focuses on treatment. I know many of you are very active in policy and I'd like to be thinking as a group about how does this work really advance health equity. So I'm gonna start by just reminding you where Kansas City is. We're right in the heart of the country. Um, we are right on the border of, of Kansas and Missouri and we are in a very diverse uh, community. Um, within Kansas City, uh, which the metro area covers a, a number of different, touches in on a, a number of different counties, but within those counties, we see populations of African Americans, about 25 to 30%. Um, we see Latinos ranging from 10 to 30% in these, in these counties. Um, and we have an increasingly diverse community in an increasingly diverse country. And so I would encourage all of us to be thinking about um, how the changing and growing um, United States population um, influences how we think about the work that we do and whether our work is benefiting all individuals. So while we've seen this tremendous progress in reducing tobacco use in the United States uh, over the past 50 years, um, we do know that this progress is not equal for all groups. So the CDC has this particular image that I like that, you know, says, even though we've made this progress, we still have a lot of work to do. And there are particular populations that are at especially high risk. We see higher tobacco rates in a number of different groups, including a number of racial and ethnic minorities, um, but also different groups that have particular barriers, particular disadvantage, particular stressors that are related to tobacco use. And so we want to keep that in mind to try to keep moving the ball forward. Of course, individuals can fall into multiple groups with intersectionality, we know that there are individuals who are particularly high risk. And in some subgroups, we see tobacco use up to 40%. So a few years ago, NCI came out with this monograph that um, I think really gets at the heart of an issue that, that many of us are passionate about. And that's the issue of really addressing tobacco related health disparities that we know that we have to address these disparities if we really want to have the major impact on reducing tobacco related disease. And there's some groups that have been particularly missed or that have not benefited as much in the past from some of our efforts. And that includes racial and ethnic minorities. It also includes light smokers and light smokers are a growing percentage of tobacco users in the United States. So we see fewer and fewer of the two pack a day smokers that we might've seen 40 years ago. And we see more and more individuals who are 
who are now using just a few cigarettes per day, even more individuals who are using none daily. And we want to be keeping those folks in mind as well. So our work focuses on African-American smokers. The prevalence of tobacco use in African-Americans is pretty similar to whites. African-Americans tend to start smoking a few years later. They tend to quit to try quitting more often, but have higher rates of relapse. So they're more likely to smoke menthol cigarettes. Menthol is really the, the um, predominant tobacco choice in the African-American community. And individuals um, who are African-American have higher cotinine levels per cigarette, which can partly be related to smoking topography, but can also be related to nicotine metabolism. And African-Americans are more likely to be uh, slower metabolizers and they can smoke fewer cigarettes per day, um, but still have the highest cancer incidence and morbidity and so even with these fewer cigarettes per day, we still see this very significant disease burden in this group. Before we get to my paper, I do wanna mention a paper that Dr. Nolan led, where she did a secondary data analysis of the huge Eagles trial. So the Eagles trial was the um, international multi-site largest pharmacotherapy trial, looking at all of the major FDA approved pharmacotherapies for smoking cessation. and uh, Dr. Nolan did a secondary analysis of this, looking specifically at black-white differences. And if you look over on the left here, those are the overall findings, and that you see that whether you're looking at brenicline, bupropion, nicotine patch, or placebo, you see um, higher abstinence rates in white smokers compared to black smokers. So there's this very clear um, difference in these two groups. What is interesting is that in her conclusions, she saw that uh, we saw that um, black moderate to heavy smokers, because the Eagle study included moderate to heavy smokers, did not include light smokers. So black moderate to heavy smokers were significantly less likely than whites to achieve abstinence across treatments, but that varenicline was the only pharmacotherapy demonstrating efficacy over placebo for black participants. So here we see this good news about varenicline as potentially being a, a particularly effective treatment for African-American moderate to heavy smokers. Now, Dr. Nolan pointed out that in the original Eagles study, there was an evaluation of a number of key factors that are important to the black population, things like menthol use, things like nicotine metabolism, things like socioeconomic status, other factors that can contribute to challenges with treatment and challenges with lifestyle change and behavior change and success in becoming smoke-free. There was also no light smokers in this study, as I mentioned. Now, Dr. Nolan's work has been really exciting because she has really found that race is, while we see this big difference in black and whites, black and white smokers, race is just a proxy for social, contextual, and biological differences. And so while we see this group difference, really there are multiple other factors that account for this difference. And so studies need to sort of in the future ideally move beyond just identifying a difference and starting to dig into why we see these differences and what are the mechanisms at play. Great paper that um, I encourage you to, to consider and I think is in the original email for the meeting today. So moving into to the key paper for this talk today and that's the KISS-4 study. Um, the primary uh, aim of this paper then was to go further with looking at varenicline for African-American smokers. And specifically, we wanted to evaluate the efficacy of varenicline versus placebo for tobacco use treatment in African-American smokers. What the main outcome in this study was um, seven-day point prevalence, smoking abstinence confirmed with cotinine at month six. So we conducted a randomized placebo-controlled trial. We did standard varenicline treatment, which is 12 weeks of treatment. We included 500 African-American daily smokers. We randomized individuals on a three to two ratio with 300 individuals being randomized to receive varenicline and 200 to receive placebo. 
our rationale in, in doing it that way was that it allowed us to put more people on active drug, which is particularly um, useful when we're working with a community and individuals who really want to be receiving active treatment. It also allows us to still look at side effects and safety of renicline use. We included light, moderate, and heavy smokers in this study. And so that's something that is different than has been done in the past. And every individual, in addition to receiving either active or placebo drug, also uh, participated with our wonderful counseling staff receiving culturally relevant, individually tailored cognitive behavioral counseling that focused a lot on health education and practical strategies to support the quitting process. I'm briefly showing you the inclusion exclusion criteria, um, partly to note that this study began before the original Eagle's uh, findings were available. And so our exclusion cr criteria was slightly more conservative than you might use in clinical practice today. Um, that individuals who were included in this study, as I mentioned, as low as one cigarette per day. These were people who were interested in quitting and that had received medication approval from a physician. So this reflects individuals that we would be potentially treating in the real world. Now I'm showing you our screening process and how we got to 500 because I wanna point out that in our screening process, because we wanted to have individuals receive approval from their, uh, receive a physician approval, that was originally a barrier. We have a significant um, proportion of individuals who didn't have a primary care physician, hadn't seen a physician in a long time. And so we actually changed our protocol at some point in time so that our study physician could be um, seeing our participants, reviewing medical history and um, helping support that connection to pharmacotherapy. But I wanna keep in mind that in the real world, there are barriers that exist to treatment. And we, we got to 500 that we randomized, as I mentioned, 300 to active, renicline, and 200 to placebo. I want to point out that with our counseling sessions that we have, that we saw no difference between the two treatment groups in terms of retention. So participants were interested in continuing to meet with our staff, to have their counseling sessions, to participate in the study. Um, I will note that we have fantastic staff that does a really good job with following up with individuals and making sure that they're aware of and that they return for their appointments. And we're in a setting where people can come and, and um, it's fairly conveniently located. Okay, who were the participants in this study? We had 500 individuals, average age 52 years, half were female. It's a relatively low income group. And as I mentioned, and as you see here at the bottom, Bottom, only 65% were covered by health insurance. So there are gaps that exist that we need to keep in mind. Our average cigarettes per day was 12.6. About half of our participants were light smokers or smoked 10 or fewer cigarettes per day. Um, we did not recruit to fill a certain number of light and heavy smokers. This is just, this is just who came to our, our program. I'm pointing out here that 79% smoked within 30 minutes of waking. And I want to emphasize that because that 30 minutes of waking marker is a proxy for physical nicotine dependence. So even though we're talking about a relatively lower uh, number of cigarettes per day, we're still looking at some significant physical dependence. The majority of our participants smoke menthol cigarettes. And um, as you can see, these are folks who've tried repeatedly to quit. The majority have tried um, even within the last year, but not everybody has used pharmacotherapy in the past. And oftentimes that's because of issues of access and affordability. So what did we find? The light blue um, indicates the 12 weeks that individuals were receiving active um, or placebo medication. And we see quit rates, early quit rates at week four, and then end of the medication phase at week 12, we see a significant impact of varenicline on significantly increasing abstinence. Um, we see really a tripling of, of 
uh, success uh, when comparing the varenicline and placebo groups. And what is particularly exciting is that we continue to see this long-term treatment effect even after individuals stop receiving medication. So even at six month follow-up and six month follow-up is a good indicator of what people might be looking even 12 months later, um, we see that individuals who use varenicline are more than twice as likely to be successful in being abstinent um, long-term. So we're very encouraged by these findings. We wanted to look further and we wanted to look just within the light smokers within the moderate to heavy smokers, do we also see a drug effect? And we do. Um, Renicline is uh, effective in increasing abstinence in light smokers. It's effective in increasing abstinence in moderate to heavy smokers. And here's another visual um, that kind of portrays the same information. The solid line showing the overall groups, the individuals who receive renicline are significantly more likely than placebo, but then the dashed lines are looking at light and moderate to heavy smokers also sh showing this, this drug effect. We did look at side effects and we saw no significant differences between any of the reported side effect symptoms. So people who are using placebo have side effects. People who are using medication are reporting side effects. And the only difference is in nausea. So individuals who received renicline were more likely to report nausea, but it was very manageable, especially with counseling around medication use um, and strategies to make medication uh, something that individuals are more comfortable taking, including things like, are you drinking? Are you eating? Are you taking it at certain times of day? And it was, it was very manageable. And we were, um, I think, successful in that. Also shown that we had similar self-reported use of medication in both conditions. So similar rates of, of um, adherence to medication in both active and placebo groups. So in trying to figure out what contributes to these group differences, we didn't see a difference in attendance. So it wasn't um, related to counseling alone. We didn't see differences in medication adherence. We also didn't see differences in this study in reward in withdrawal symptoms, in craving, which has been found in some, but not all uh, Brennan trials. Um, and I think there are some limitations in and how well we can look at that in this type of study. Um, but yet we did see the significant treatment effects. So in, in summary, Renaclin was effective in promoting short 12-week uh, and long-term abstinence in African-American daily smokers. And these findings are replicating a study that Dr. Nolan conducted using active Renaclin for blacks and whites. And, um, and so again, we're, we're encouraged with this outcome. Renaclin was effective in promoting smoking abstinence in light smokers and in moderate to heavy smokers. I really wanna emphasize this point about light smokers because again, we have more and more light smokers in our population. We know from meta-analyses that even smoking one cigarette per day can significantly increase the risk of tobacco-related morbidity and mortality. Um, and we also know that in the vast majority of pharmacotherapy trials in the past, light smokers haven't been included. So there's very little work um, that's involved light smoking and finding pharmacotherapy options. And the findings that we're seeing is that light smokers do have physical dependence. They have challenges with quitting and they benefit from pharmacotherapy, um, particularly when looking at um, either adequately dosing with nicotine replacement, which is often a challenge, or using non-nicotine medications like varenicline. So I really encourage people to be thinking about treating um, and supporting quitting in light smokers. Varenicline was safe and well-tolerated. So this supports findings from the EGLES trial and other trials that um, varenicline can be our first option that we talk with individuals about and support individuals with, um, with quitting. Um, and even with all of this, 
good news, we still see relatively low uh, abstinence rates. And so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. We have limited number of pharmacotherapy options. So I think continuing to push the envelope in terms of finding um, strategies to enhance use of pharmacotherapy, strategies to consider in terms of whether we extend treatment duration, whether we change treatments, um, how we can support individuals perhaps in more of a chronic disease model and be looking at supporting abstinence over a long period of time in different ways. These are things I, I think we need to think about if we really want to push, um, if we really want to more fully support treatment of individuals and think about strategies to do that. Um, the next study that we're doing right now is looking at extended treatment. So I want to just put this in the context of our overall Kick It at Swope findings. Our Kick It at Swope studies and our Quit to Live studies led by Dr. Nolan have really emphasized this benefit of pharmacotherapy for African-American smokers. African-Americans are interested in quitting. They're motivated to quit but there are barriers in place and we need to help overcome those barriers. Um, Non-nicotine medications are something to encourage, but that's where you also have the barriers related to having a provider and being able to access a prescription. Um, also, as I mentioned, emphasizing brenoclin for treatment of light smokers, really seeing a threefold benefit of using brenoclin compared to placebo and then supporting additional efforts. So let's pause and, and take some additional questions that you might have about the study and open up um, the discussion. I know we've got great moderators. Thank you so much, Dr. Cox. This is just a really fantastic presentation. Um, I'll turn this over to our discussant right now. And I do encourage the audience, uh, please put your comments in the Q&A. We'd love to hear them. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's a reason why this study was published in JAMA. It's, it's really a high quality trial and really important for getting at the racial disparities that exist. Um, I guess I have a few questions though. Um, one would be, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about your choice of comparator here. So what was the value of having a placebo control and maybe how you chose that as opposed to an active comparator? You showed us the Eagles trial results before where um, you know, placebo was dominated by by uh, some of the other active interventions and sort of, did you feel like there was clinical equipoise here or, um, you know, did you feel like the, the research question sort of necessitated the um, placebo control? I think that's a critically important question and it's a really important consideration when people are conducting treatment studies. And I think the questions that you really want to hit in your treatment studies can totally change the answer to that question. Um, in this particular study, because Renaclin at the time had never had a placebo controlled study with African Americans, and um, because of pre Eagle's concerns about side effects and potential risks of Renaclin, those two questions support the idea of comparing Renaclin to placebo. We knew one of the things that also made us kind of comfortable in this study is that we had previously um, conducted Jazz Alawalia led a study that not only looked at two forms of or at a um, active and placebo pharmacotherapy, but also looked at two types of counseling. And so we knew that we were using a counseling approach that enhanced quitting compared to other counseling approaches. So we felt confident that at least our placebo group was getting an effective behavioral treatment that was gonna be supporting quitting. Um, but to really answer questions about side effects, um, it was important to have the placebo condition. Now, by having a placebo condition, it also influenced our choice of not doing a one-to-one -one randomization, but of randomizing people three to active um, relative to two to placebo. Because then again, we can answer those safety questions, but we can still put more people on active, on active medication. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I think an, another point is um, the retention rates in your study were just 
really impressive. And I think anybody who's ever run a clinical trial would be very envious of them. And I wonder if you can, you, you mentioned a little bit about how the uh, clinic's conveniently located, but can you just expand on sort of what efforts you take to boost retention in your studies and sort of uh, any guidance you'd have for other researchers? Sure. And Nikki, and, and I, I guess to... another, sorry, oh, sorry another ahead. point is just like, yeah, so just also just, um, you know, were there any any steps you took to sort of tailor to this particular population and, th you know, re reaching um, uh, African-American smokers in particular? Um, I, I'd be curious about. Sorry. So in terms of, so what I hear is a sort of a retention question, and then also just as they're tailoring within the intervention itself. Is that right? Uh, specific to the retention strategy, I, I suppose, okay. um, if there was anything, you know, culturally tailored or anything along those lines. Okay. So Nikki, um, Dr. Nolan is with us as well. And she and I do this work together at SWOPE, which is this federally uh, qualified health center in Kansas City that's, that's um, in a great location um, within the metro area. Um, Nikki, feel free to jump into this discussion if you have thoughts on that as well. But I'm thinking like one, there is a big difference between being near neighborhoods and near major highways and on a bus route and in a location that has parking that is one of those just logistical pieces that actually makes it so much easier for people to come to your study to begin with. Um, having fantastic staff that really go above and beyond with making sure that they're keeping relationships and communication with participants and following up with phone calls and text messages and postcards and things like that, I think make a big difference. Um, Nikki, what comes to mind to you in on this issue? Of retention? Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying yeah. to Sorry, you're reading the chat, the... but that's okay. Yeah. Um, related to retention and, and our really high retention rates. And then also the question of, do we do anything different with retention that's more targeted to African-Americans? I, th I think of tar our targeting of our intervention more related to our recruitment and to our counseling, yeah. but, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we have over time developed a really nice tracking system that enables our counselors to very easily see when participants are coming due for visits. And then we've instituted a series of reminders. Um, that's through, you know, email, text message, phone calls, voice, I mean, just any possible way you could think of. Um, I think also just um, we've, you know, our, we have a diverse staff who develops relationships with the patients. Um, and patients really are, regardless of whether they've quit or not, they're motivated to um, come back in and, and um, see the staff. I think they just, that's a testament to the relationships that our staff develop with the participants. Also flexibility is key. Um, you know, we will um, go to people's places of work. We will go to, you know, other places where, you know, they, which would make it more convenient for them to complete a study visit. Um, as long as it's not a visit where we need to collect a bio specimen that requires a lab, um, we have a lot of flexibility around those issues, meeting the participants where they're at. Yeah, I'll mention as well that one of the things, I don't know what the effect of this is, but one of the things that we do um, incorporate from day one, from the very first time that we talk about even interest in participating in a study is that by participating in a study, an individual is doing something hopefully for their own health, hopefully for the benefit of their family. But we really emphasize that participation, whether you quit smoking or don't quit smoking, is really contributing to the community because it's contributing to information about how to best help African-Americans stop smoking. And I think that that speaks to some of our participants. I think some of our participants who don't quit but keep coming back they're doing it in part because they're proud to be able to contribute to something that they hope benefits others. Great, thank you so much for, for those uh, 
tidbits about sort of how to approach this. Um, I, yeah, it, it is a common challenge that I think a lot of researchers face. Um, another challenge is relates to cotinine testing um, as it's specific to your, to your study um, that oftentimes, you know, e-cigarettes and nicotine replacement therapy will lead to, you know, a false positive. And I'm curious about, uh, did you track that in the study and uh, how you, I don't know if you did anything with sensitivity analyses or uh, how you treated people who might have been using those products? So um, I think I used the same basic protocol as Dr. Nolan in, in her studies as well. So so feel free to like correct me, Nikki, if you think I'm missing something here. But we do met, we do ask for self report of other tobacco use, um, e cigarette use, and uh, nicotine replacement use, if for some reason somebody decided that they were going to start using that um, at follow-up. Um, we, in KISS-4, so in this particular study, if individuals self-reported that they had quit, um, for almost everybody, we would use cotinine verification. For the handful of individuals that reported uh, quitting, and using nicotine replacement of some sort. Then we did um, analysis of an anabasine and anatabine as a way to evaluate tobacco specific biomarkers um, so that it wasn't just a nicotine specific like cotinine, uh, it was cotinine verification. If you're using some other form of nicotine, um, that could be um, disrupting that finding, but we, we would use anabasin and anatabian. Well, it, I don't believe that we were, um, differentiating in terms of e-cigarette use or other tobacco use in this particular study. Great. Uh, last question, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to, um, the moderator. So I, I was just, just, you mentioned medication adherence was quite, uh, was, was similar across groups. I was just curious how high it was and, and do most patients sort of adhere you know, to the full 12 week regimen or uh, is there a lot of uh, non-adherence? And if there is non-adherence, what might, some of the factors might be related to that, that, you know, based on your research? That is a good question. I was just, I have the answer to that question in the paper. I just don't have the number off the top of my head. I think that we have, I mean, I think that there's about, ugh, sorry, I think there's about 80% that are reporting some medication use, at least early in treatment. Nikki, do you think I'm off on that? Is it closer to, I don't, I should have had the paper like literally in my hand at the same time. Um, I have the paper up. What's okay. the question? I'll, okay, I'll, sorry. I the question is, are um, our rates of medication adherence? Oh, I'll look. Okay, sorry. Look. Um, and what, and are you asking, like, what do we do to support medication adherence? Uh, no, I was just curious about what the reasons for non-adherence oh, for non might be. Um, yeah, and specifically as it relates to sort of uh, use of Renaclin or, or yeah. other pharmacotherapy. So I will say in my study, I don't think that we took the opportunity that we could have to dig into a little bit more about why people are not adherent. And in a study that um, Nikki just completed, I think we have some data from counselors that's getting a little bit better idea of like why, for people who aren't continuing, why aren't they continuing? Because you could say, um, I was using the medication, it helped me quit, now I'm quit, so I don't need to keep taking the medication. Maybe I'm only four weeks in, but I feel good, so I'm not gonna keep you know, taking it. That's very, very different than I was taking the medication, I'm struggling, I'm still smoking, so I don't see the point of continuing to take medication, right? That's another thing. You also have all the people who may be like, I'm taking the medication, but I'm you know, just forgetting it a lot. Um, or I worry that maybe I don't wanna be continuing. So th I think there's these, these sort of differences and I don't actually have good data on that other than sort of anecdotally what we hear from counselors. Oh, Great. I can take that too. I mean, we just looked at this in another study and we, it's exactly what Lisa said. So there's a good chunk of people who have quit smoking on the medication. So they quit taking the medication because they don't think they need it anymore. 
then the other chunk of individuals just simply um, are not finding the medication to be helpful or they don't like the medication or their goal of abstinence has changed. So they, it, it no longer is something that they are um, interested in or focused on. And did you happen to see Nikki and looking at the paper, like how high our self-reported um, adherence rates were? So. Well, I've got, yeah, it, it looks like uh, it's about 80%. Yeah. It goes down a little bit over time, but it, it's yeah. about 80%. It's supplemental. If anyone wants to look at this, the adherence data is in the supplemental uh, materials supplement too, in particular. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll pass it then back over to Catherine. I think there was one other question in the chat that Mike Pesco had, but um, you can take over. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Yes, and audience members, please remember to put your comments in the Q&A. We would just love to hear from you. Uh, we have a couple of comments. Uh, Nikki has been doing a great job with the Q&A, uh, but we do have a comment, a couple comments from Annie Thomas. Is it possible for someone who's been uh, smoking for 30 plus years to use Vernaclean? I have a patient who's afraid to quit due to knowing friends who quit uh, and died after quitting. Is this a myth? Uh, and also another question from Annie, uh, what are the risks of stopping the medications once they're started? Okay, so um, I, I appreciate these real world, I mean, the, the questions that actually kind of are relaying what patients have said to people because things like, you know, I knew someone who took this medication and they died, or I knew someone who took this medication and they had increased depression or something like that. And um, those individual stories have so much impact on an individual smoker, but that's one of the reasons why it's great to be able to share these larger research findings, because the reality is smokers die younger than non-smokers, right? So there are years of lives or years of life that are lost because of tobacco use. So um, just because someone happened to start taking medication and something negative occurred doesn't mean that the medication, you know, caused this. And I think it's helpful for providers to be able to like talk those issues through. If you remember decades back, uh, when nicotine patch first came out and, you know, you get one news story of one person who used the patch and then it had a heart attack and they're not putting in the context of smokers have heart attacks all the time. Um, it's, it's hard to put these in. So I think the overwhelming data, especially from Eagles, but also from other studies are really supporting the safety of using Brenaclean. And I think if you look at the data, the age range of participants in these studies is really, really broad, skewing older. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the benefits of quitting and the benefits of quitting, even for older individuals, is very well documented. And I think it's probably worth thinking through. Um, having those discussions to ease concerns and then to support individuals after they begin so that if they do say, oh, wow, I had increased nausea or something, um, that you can work with them to help people be more comfortable. I don't know if that fully addresses that's, what you were just saying or if I only address part. I think that's great. Uh, Annie indicated that, that she, uh, she, they said, thank you. Uh, just a quick question from one of our uh, panelists uh, from Mike Pesco. Does Renaclean improve odds of people transitioning from heavy smoking to light smoking as well as quitting altogether? That could be another potential benefit. That is a really good question that I have not looked at yet with this particular data set. And Nikki, I don't know if you looked at that with the one of the previous Quit to Live studies or not. Um, just a second. Am I unmuted? Sorry. Yes. No, yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay. Um, we have not looked at CPD reduction, um, which is really what this question is getting at. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, you know, reviewers of, of manuscripts really slap our, our hands or when we look at CPD reduction as an outcome. And so we just have stopped doing it. Um, but I do think that this is an important question that it's worth us just taking a, a secondary look at. Because my guess is, is that, um, yeah, there was a, for those who did not quit, 
the reduction in CPD from baseline is likely um, substantial and significant. And I think that's an important question when you're thinking about long-term pharmacotherapy support for individuals who are trying to reduce risk. Um, and while on one hand, I really want to emphasize that even smoking one cigarette per day, even smoking occasionally is a significant health risk. And so getting to zero is really the ideal. I also know that if we have individuals who are smoking a pack a day and they can get down to smoking, you know, three or four cigarettes per day, that's a huge win in many ways, right? I mean, there's many areas of tobacco related um, morbidity that would be that would be impacted there. And so thinking about um, supporting, I mean, having more evidence that can speak to those issues. And so secondary data analysis, that, that's a great idea. I appreciate that. Great. Uh, just one more question, and then we'll, we'll, re we'll return to your talk, um, and then we'll have about 15 minutes left then. But there's a question. Uh, at one point, you said there were factors such as parking lots, others. Were those factors associated with adherence to pharmacotherapy, and were those factors observed in your trial? When you were, I think this is in relation to your uh, response to Justin about these uh, factors that were logistical, log logistically helpful. I don't know how to measure that. Um, per se, I do know that we have we've had we had one study a long time ago that we um, conducted with individuals coming to a different location that simply wasn't as convenient and it was super hard to get individuals to do this. I mean, when you think about individuals who may have one or two jobs or may have limited transportation and Again, we're in Kansas City, so we're not in New York City where you have, you know, multiple consistent um, public transportation options. We have we have some public transportation op options that are fantastic, and we have lots and lots of geographic space that is not well covered by public transportation. And so sometimes those logistical issues, I think, make, you know, can make a difference for individuals. Um, thinking about time of day, we're pretty flexible. Um, and we've found that when we are working with, with uh, secondary sites that have very limited hours, it's, it's just a challenge for people who are working and have families and maybe trying to juggle two jobs and have limited transportation. So those logistical issues, I think, are important. I don't know how to, like, um, to, to say that how much of an effect it has, um, but it seems like it's been um, important to us. Thank you very much. Um, I'll let you go continue. Uh, thank you so much for those great answers. And we've got about 13 minutes left. So thanks so much. So I wanted to um, come back to the question that in that I have in my mind as we're talking about this, particularly in this audience, this is that sort of same uh, CDC image that helps us remember that not all of our efforts are reaching everybody in our population or not helping everybody equally. And so I want to just ask the group, the audience, I'm really curious about how you think advances in tobacco treatment and advances in policy can help advance health equity. And in thinking about this study, again, this is a, a treatment study and I really focus on treatment issues. But when I think about what potential policy related issues arise from the findings of this particular study, um, access and cost come to mind as I sort of mentioned throughout the study. Here's, um, I think a nice figure that just really emphasizes that there, even with the Affordable, Air, uh, Affordable Care Act, which really supported tobacco use treatment in, in, in a historic way. Um, even with that, we still see that there are individuals who do not have insurance. And so when we're talking about something like the benefit of Renaclin and the big benefit of Renaclin in a, a group like African-Americans, um, for individuals who don't have insurance um, or for individuals who don't have a provider, those are big barriers to accessing this type of treatment. And so 
I'm curious about like what are policy changes or differences that we could potentially be looking at to help overcome some of these barriers. And I just want to point out cost. And cost is an issue that I'm particularly uh, interested in in Brennaclin right now because um, there has been some production issues over the past year and a half. Um, and there are there, even though genetic Brennaclin is now available, it the prices are extraordinarily high right now in the United States. And so if you are an individual who has insurance, your insurance may be covering these costs. But if you are an individual who doesn't have insurance and you're looking at pharmacotherapy options, varenicline may simply be beyond any possible um, access for, for many people. And so I just wanted to give this as a particular example. But I'm curious what discussion comes from this group and what other questions you guys um, might be bringing to the table or what thoughts you might have on these issues. And that could also include other issues that, that impact um, particularly high-risk groups or other uh, issues that, that impact African-American smokers, which is obviously the focus of our team and, um, and the work that Dr. Nolan and I do, but I'll be quiet for a minute. This is really great, Dr. Cox. Thank you so much. And Dr. Nolan as well. Um, I'll turn this over to our discussant and then we've got some more questions in the Q&A. Please audience members um, share your comments. Dr. Nolan is doing a wonderful job managing the Q&A, but we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so I, I don't think I have solutions per se to, to this issue, but I, I, I have a few brief thoughts. Um, one is sort of the role that uh, social determinants play in terms of not being able to afford or access uh, treatment. And so just thinking about sort of the you know, systematic um, underinvestment in schools and communities that affects um, where Black people live, I think that um, that reduces their economic opportunities, which you know reduces their ability to afford medication. And so, to the extent that we have policies that redistribute resources to um, you know those uh, structurally disadvantaged groups, I think that that would indirectly help. That's sort of like a big picture thing. But um, I also think that there, more recently, um, Joe Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act, which. Uh, Part of that negotiates prices for certain drugs within Medicare. Um, and that's the first time that that's been done in a long time. And it also sets a hard cap on out of pocket spending. That's only for Medicare people, uh, uh, beneficiaries. And I think actually uh, smoking cessation pharmacotherapy is not part of the uh, excluded from those price negotiations. Mm -hmm. But you could imagine that being sort of a model or a framework for. Um, being applied to other drugs and potentially outside of Medicare too. So I, I think that there could be some possibilities there. Um, another thing that I would mention is that I think Chantix is now off patent. And so there are there is opportunity for competition from generics um, to sort of drive down prices. And so to the extent that there's more generics in the market, that, that could help. Um, the other thing is sort of relates to what you mentioned earlier about the convenience of SWOPE in your community, and that maybe you could think about community-based treatment options in terms of um, you know moving outside of a clinic, whether this is a mobile clinic or going to where people live, and uh, you know increasing access that way. Um, it, I think there are, you know there's definitely a lot of research here at UCSF I know related to that, and there might be some opportunities there. So those are just a few thoughts, um, feel free to respond or uh, you can just move to the questions. Great. Lisa, please, uh, or Dr. Fox, please answer if you have thoughts or we can move along. Those are great. Well, I was going to ask Nikki, do you, what do you, what are you seeing in the, or in this area, or do you want to jump in with any thoughts related to this? Not necessarily even cost um, or access, but anything related to sort of where our work touches policy potentially. Yeah, I mean, 
the issue that we you know continue to have which lisa has highlighted very well is that um, many of our participants don't have um, a regular source of health care they don't have a medical home and therefore they're not eligible for some of these assistance programs like um, you know medicare that would um, lower their prescription drug costs and so you know while we i think that's another reason why um, you know we get you know, such a good response to our studies is that we're providing medication to them that it's not available to, I mean, it should be available to them, but in, in reality, it is not available to them at a cost that they can afford. Um, so I think that's, you know, really an important issue. And honestly, I, I don't know how we're going to solve the, the issue either. Um, the generic for Veraniclin, frankly, costs, what is it, $320 for a three-month course? in the US now, Lisa, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's, that's per month. That's a 30 day supply. Yeah. So the, the generic is um, not. At least this, not I mean, this feasible. is just the, you know, this week looking at it because, you know, Pfizer had production disruption. And so we have, I believe I could be wrong, but I believe only one producer in the United States right now that's making generic Branaclean and the costs are just out of reach, I think, for, for many, many, many individuals. Um, and hopefully that will resolve. Um, and that would be also hoping that other manufacturers choose to take on this particular medication, because I think we've seen that in in other areas of medicine where you have a relatively specific um, medication and maybe you have limits in how many producers are out there and that are interested in, in putting time and energy into, um, into that. So yes, I would hope that we would see some movement um, on, on Brennan costs. I am thankful that the Affordable Care Act covers pharmacotherapy costs for smoking cessation treatment. But again, it's for individuals who are outside of that, who are, who are not covered and, or who don't um, have something to support their access and affordability there. Yeah. So I can make a plug for something else. I mean, I don't have yeah. a solution to this either, but this is something that, you know, we talk a lot about and think a lot about, but, um, you know, if we think about the the situation for many of our participants' lives, um, you know, they're struggling with, you know, I, I think of it as the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So stable housing, uh, um, mm -hmm. stable food, and, you know, just a source of income. And so when you, when there's that much instability in life, and then we, you know, try to, to the goal then is to quitting smoking. I mean, we're really at, failing to address the root cause of many of their issues. And so NIH has recently started um, putting calls out, and I've seen a few that have been funded, um, that are addressing these other causes in terms of providing housing vouchers, like meaning facilitating health behavior change indirectly through addressing the the chaos and the instability in lives. And I would love to do more of that work um, within our, our studies. I mean, the, in, one of, in one of my studies, this, this, the largest predictor of who quit was whether or not you owned a home. And it was a huge, huge predictor. So people who owned a home were significantly more likely to quit. Unfortunately, the majority of our participants in this study did not own a home. So really addressing disadvantage and those root causes related to that. Great. Thank you so much for this really fantastic discussion. Um, I, we have wonderful comments in the Q&A, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time, and it, it's, it's just about one now. So thank you so much for the comments, the discussion, this really fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us here. And if anyone wants to email me any follow-up, that's great.